would have worked uh, better with a third person here singing, but the Demon Revs and, and Sergey Revs and have no friends. Just the two do of us. Do, we can make do, it if do, we do, try. Do, just do, the do, two do, of us. Do, you and do. I. You and I or you and me? Doesn't matter. Doesn't, um, doesn't matter at all. Well, today we're excited to bring you our interview with Nigel Eccles, the founder of FanDuel. Now, you probably have heard of FanDuel before, but if you haven't, it is a fantasy sports betting company that he started about 10 years ago. And for that company, he ended up raising over $400 million. They ended up selling for hundreds of millions of dollars in in, in a billion-dollar market. And he started this company in the UK. But in this episode, we cover so much ground because Nigel has not only been a part of several startups, but he has started several startups. He has pivoted many times along the way. And we talk about some of the challenges of how do you figure out if I'm building the right thing and the difficulty of giving up on your baby that you've worked on for so long and starting from scratch and how he went about making those very difficult decisions. By the way, Nigel is a sweetheart. I'm always somewhat surprised by how down to earth some of these entrepreneurs are of these massive massive quickly growing companies and how willing they are to share their wisdom with us and now he's actually working on another really cool company called flick that's flickapp.com disrupting the podcast space what he's doing with flick is creating a uh, a way for podcasters people like me and vadim to create and nurture our communities right so if you're listening to the show and you want to talk to us or you want to talk to other listeners of the show you really have no way of doing that today except for maybe email and and perhaps um, if you follow our Facebook group or our Instagram, that's about it. But Nigel and his team are creating this chat platform. Think of it as almost like a WhatsApp for your favorite podcast where you can go and talk about the show and talk about specific episodes with other fans. And Vadim and I are going to be jumping right into it. We created our page on Flick app. So if you go to flick.group slash the mentors flick.group slash the mentors you can jump right in and talk to us and we're going to start threads there and have conversations and we'll see if you like the tool this episode is really awesome because nigel tells a story of how he went from a management consultant to starting his own company how he built a co-founding team how they iterated on their businesses and ultimately landed on a massive opportunity and then in part two next week we'll talk about how he's doing that again with his company Flick app. So super, super useful episode. If you're just starting out and you want to hear a first person account of how somebody goes from literally nothing to putting together a team and growing it to a massive multi hundred million dollar a year company, this is the episode for you. It's actually a great follow up to an episode we did recently on how to stumble into greatness because Nigel ended up following the exact blueprint that we discussed there, which is you got to try something, you have to listen to the market. And you have to adjust until you find that big idea. Please enjoy our conversation with Welcome Nigel Eccles. Welcome back to Eccles. The Mentors. This is Vadim. And Sergey. And yes, you're listening to a show where we tell stories of ordinary people that became extraordinary entrepreneurs despite lack of experience, money, or connections. And today with us, we have Nigel Eccles, who has founded a lot of companies, but one that you probably have heard of is FanDuel. And today, we're also going to talk about his relatively new company, Flick. And we're going to learn about how he got those companies started, some of the best practices that he has to share about entrepreneurship, and actually how you even decide what to build in the first place. Because we know a lot of our listeners find that's sometimes difficult to do, especially if you're a first-time entrepreneur. How do you know that I'm building the right thing? And how do I know when to give up on something? And I think Nigel has a wealth of experience there. So we're going to get into all of that. But Nigel, I want to start, um, you know, I know you've been on a bunch of different podcasts lately, Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people that, you know, you've shared your story with. So we want to, um, we're not going to talk about every little thing here because we just wouldn't have time for it. But I know you're from Northern Ireland and you grew up on a farm (laughs) milking cows. And I also know that you studied mathematics in undergrad. And in your own words, you were a little bit of a late bloomer when it comes to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the days before you first considered entrepreneurship as a career path, tell us a little bit about what are some of those early jobs that you had after you graduated and what kind of skills did you pick up in those jobs that you think helped you be successful later on? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me on the show. I really, uh, this is great. Um, 
you know, I learned a lot in the immediate years after leaving university. I think one of the reasons I didn't go into entrepreneurship is there was no role model for it. Like there was no, at the time, there wasn't really many great examples, particularly in the UK, of people going out and starting businesses. And so it wasn't even a consideration. I just wouldn't have known, like I wouldn't even have had the aspiration, even if I'd known how to do it or any kind of template. And so I went into a very traditional role, which is going into consultancy. I did that for a couple of years and then I actually went into a startup and that's what really awoke in my excitement because the experience of being a startup of being a consultancy was just phenomenal. And this was a company called Flutter.com, which was a online betting exchange in the UK. And it was, I just loved the dynamism, the ability to kind of talk to customers, find out what they wanted and then fix things, change things so quickly. And so it was management consulting? That yeah, you it was management doing? consulting. Right? It was very first job. And from there, yeah, you're probably going to ask the same thing because we think the same exact thing all the time. <laughs> we're identical twins. Uh, what job did you get at mm -hmm. that startup and how many people were there? Yeah, so I joined Flutter.com when there was, I think it was employee number 85. They actually had, this is like 99, so high to the boom. Actually, it was 2000. Uh, now, within 12 months, I was employee number 85 of a you know, 30 person startup. <laughs> but uh, so I, I, you know, that when we went into the bus, but we were, uh, I went into a product manager role, which is a great role going into startups because you really get to see how the product gets built. Um, and I know I'm sure product management maybe in 2000 had a little bit of a different definition than it does mm -hmm. now. But how do you think you went from a management consulting role to a product management role? Like, why were you attractive to the founders of Flutter? Why did they decide to hire you, you think? Well, it's actually a funny story because in 2000, there was a mindset they were going to revolutionize industries and the industries they were going to revolutionize, they actually actively didn't want to hire from them because they were like, oh, they've got a really old school mindset. This is the new world. We don't want to hire people from that industry. And so Flutter was trying to revolutionize uh, the betting industry, which was a very old school traditional industry in Britain. And so they didn't hire anybody from that industry. I hadn't been in the industry, but I'd always been really interested in the betting market and in different forms of betting. With my background in mathematics, I'd always been fascinated by it. And so when I turned up, I was one of the few people there that were like, wow, this guy knows a lot about betting. That might be quite useful, but he's not one of these crusty old sort of bookmakers. And so that's what they kind of liked about me, that I had this sort of passion at the topic. And I had kind of spent a lot of time, you know, researching it and looking into it. And so they liked that. But I didn't really know that much about the industry. We kind of discovered that, you know, and that, that's something I learned. Interesting. I was just talking to my class today about when you're starting a business and when you're trying to get a new job, that's what could give you a competitive advantage is what you know. And yeah. it's kind of funny that you had that expertise just from something you were interested in yourself, yes, not like you worked in that industry. You didn't study that. I mean, I no, think not at all. <laughs> you, you couldn't study couldn't that. Even study it. Uh, but you knew enough about it to impress the founders. Yeah, and it's certainly... The opportunity is always in these kind of new sectors. I would even put podcasting in this great example where, you know, media companies are now going, oh, pod podcasting is hot. We need people who have that experience. And you could see a student just like spending the last couple of years really immersing themselves in it. So when they become the graduate, their resume looks amazing. Wow, you have two years experience of podcasting. You're, you know, you're an expert. And so that's, you know, in these categories where that are new emerging, where two years experience in that category makes you an expert. They're great places to, to kind of study and to be, you know, to have knowledge. So tell us what happened then in the time that you spent at Flutter. How long were you there for? Mm -hmm. And what was the change in mind shift between, you know, being an individual contributor or maybe whatever your role was uh, at Flutter to then deciding I'm going to start my own company? Yeah. So the context of that is important because I joined in 2000, which was the very height of the early 2000s, the very height of the boom. And we went into the bust, which was was not an immediate thing, but it was a very long slide. And you also have to remember during this long slide, we also believed it was going to come back, right? It was like, oh, it's just a blip. It'll come back. But it started to become very apparent it wasn't. The Flutter concept was that it was a like an eBay for batting. And what we discovered was it didn't really work. Like people didn't really want it. At the same time, we had this competitor called Betfair that had the New York Stock Exchange of betting, where instead of being the eBay where it was its individual bets, it was more of a, like a financial transaction. Betfair was doing really well. And we had Flutter said, we want a bit of that. We want to be that business. And so as one of the few people in the room that knew anything about betting, I was given the job 
to basically copy Betfair. And that's what Flutter did. We essentially copied them. And within a year of us starting that project, we ended up merging with Betfair because we were essentially trying to do the same thing. The economy was looking horrible. And our investors and their investors were like, you know what? I'd rather have a smaller part of a sure thing than having you know all of something that I don't know is going to work out. Interesting. So when they told you, the leadership told you, we want you to copy yeah. our competitor, was there any sense of how are we going to be different? Or it was literally, let's just do the same thing. That's well, actually, it's funny. They, they didn't give me the job to copy. They were actually, look, we want to beat them. And I'm like, great. First thing, and, and I, my view was we need to copy them because they've got this product right. And you know, kind of, there's definitely an ego thing where you don't want to copy. But when you see something's working and they've got it right, you're like, okay, the market has moved. This is the way consumers expect it to look. And so what I said is we're going to copy and we're going to extend. We're going to do that. That's the market. And then we're going to start to put in other functionality and features that the consumers want that they don't have. And that's essentially what we did. And so we really took what they had, which was genius. Like they had really built an amazing product. And then we started to extend with other functionality. We built a much better interface, much better way that you could interact with a product, that you could place bets, you could manage your bets that Betfair hadn't done. And so we were moving from behind to actually having a better product. And so it was kind of a clone and extend strategy. Hmm, interesting. And were you going after different customers at all? No, essentially the same customers. Yeah, like we had some of our own customers and then we really were going after their customers. Got it. So you essentially ultimately ended up creating a product that had more functionality, better design, yeah. and they acquired you because it was attractive to them. Well, yeah. So what was happening is we started 2001, we had something like a sort of, a, I think it was like 2 or 3% market share of this market that was worth something like, I think the number was like 50 million in, in turnover, in total bets, right? And so our margin was that maybe only 5% of that number. So it wasn't a very big market. But we had 4% of that $50 million market. By the end of 2001, when we merged with them, we had a 30% market share of a $500 million market. So the market was exploding and we were taking share. And so I think Betfair were like, look, we're still in the lead, but we're losing share. And also Betfair were running out of money. And our side was like, well, yeah, we're gaining, but 9-11 has just happened and things are looking really bleak. And this may never be a business at all. Doesn't it make sense that we merge the two businesses? Interesting. So it sounds like after that, based on what I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you went the corporate route and then you worked on a graduate degree. Is that right? Yeah. Well, no, I, I what after I did, I worked in another startup in the gaming industry, which uh, basically relaunched another betting exchange. And then it was 2003 by this point. It was still very bleak for startups. And I actually went back into consultancy and I went to work for McKinsey for, for four years, which I loved, but was very different. And during that period, I sort of said, look, I really want to be an entrepreneur. You know, it's really interesting. It's some great people in McKinsey. I love working with them. The work's really interesting. But I knew that I deep down, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And really, I was just kind of counting the days to whenever I could leave and then go and do my own thing. Mm. And so what was that day or a series of days where you ended up coming to that decision? Because, you know, I'm sure at McKinsey, it's stable. You're getting a yeah. good paycheck. You, you know, you're starting a family. Yeah. Where does that switch happen to you? Clearly, you were already intrigued by the couple of yeah. startup experiences you had. So the pull was there. Yeah. But how do you actually make that decision? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny. One of the things at McKinsey, um, you know, a big part is ambition you, for a lot of entrepreneurs. Like they want to be successful. And for me, a lot of the partners I find really inspiring. But then some of the ones that made it were like kind of less inspiring. And then they just sort of put in the work and they, you know, you know, they showed up and they, they got a partner. For me, I find that really demotivating. I was like, I thought a partnership should be like the ultimate. And I started to think, well, I'm just going on this track that I'm going to work really hard to get. And, but, and I also sort of knew I want to be a founder. I want to go and leave. And so basically started that process. Um, I did have a short stint at a, at a media company, which was kind of closer to the area I wanted to be. I thought if I'm going to do a startup, it's probably going to be in media. And so. I went and worked at a media company, realized that was a terrible move for me. Like I didn't want to be in a traditional media company trying to discover the 21st century. And I knew then that I 
just like it was too much to just sort of like put it off i had to go and do it i had to basically go and do my own thing so what was that first step that you took toward making that a reality yeah so i started working on ideas uh, and sort of thinking oh, this is a great concept and started to go into like startup events uh to meet to other potential founders and at one of those i met my co-founders of angel um is uh tom and rob and they also had a startup they were ready they were full-time in their startup and they were younger than I was. They were really engineers. Um, How old were you at this point? I was in my, I think, early, mid-30s. Mm -hmm. And they were in their early to mid-20s. And they sort of had, they had a product, they had great engineering expertise, but they didn't really have a good handle on their market and how to you know, raise money. So we kind of got talking and what became clear was they had the technical expertise and the product expertise and I could raise, well, I thought I could raise the finance and had a better handling on the marketing side. And so we kind of spent a lot of time talking to each other. And I was sort of initially trying to help them fix their idea. And they were helping me figure out how to do engineering for my idea. And then after a period of months, we were like, you know what, maybe we should just work together and come together on one idea. And that was really the, the genesis. So did you end up convincing them to stop working on their idea? Yeah, yeah. So their idea was really interesting. So there was around, this was around 2007. They had a really a competitor to Facebook before Facebook had sort of really taken off. It was an idea of allowing people to like organize in groups. It was you know, there was a lots of different parts that were really interesting and it was still, it, it was starting to become a bit of a, one of these kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of a term, a smorgasbord. It had a little of everything, right? And they knew that. They'd be like, oh, they'd be great of this feature or this feature. And they found it really hard to like focus on one area. And additionally, once Facebook started to come in, we were like, actually, I think it's all Facebook. And so my idea was very different with the idea born of media was it was going, we were going to build a prediction market around news events. This was the precursor to Fangil uh, and this product was called HubDub and that's what we all agreed on we would work on. Hmm. Interesting. And by the way, this is a classic mistake that product oriented people mm -hmm. make is they just want it to be pretty and do yeah. a lot of stuff. Build, build new stuff. Yeah. But when you try to do everything, you end up not you being really anything. good at anything. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, one thing I really want to quickly touch on is that it seems like your process of finding co-founders happened miraculously quickly. I, this is such a, a sticking point for so mm -hmm. many business founders is like, how do I find a technical founder? founder? And the first answer is like, you got to meet them. Yeah. And you seem to meet the right people, collaborate with them on a project, and then turn them into co-founders yeah. in a relatively short order. Yeah. Why do you think that worked out for you? Because you ended up working with those guys for a while. Yeah, and still do. I yeah. still work with one of those co-founders. Um, so I get this question a lot, uh, help a lot of entrepreneurs. And I get a lot of like, how would I meet a technical co-founder? Um, I think the first thing to recognize, it is incredibly hard, right? There's, uh, I think someone said when they were at um, a startup event, they were like, you know, who, you know, these are like sort of kind of solo founders and, you know, who here is, wants to be a, a, an entrepreneur and all the harms go up and, you know, who here is technical, small number, who here is looking for a technical founder and suddenly like 90% of the hands go up. So you're in this huge mismatch. That's the first thing to recognize. It's just going to be incredibly hard. Where I've recommended people to go is like, as a non-technical co-founder, your job is essentially you could sum a lot of it down to sales. You need to sell yourself. You need to sell the vision. You need to sell it to raise money. You need to sell to hire the team. And so if you're not technical, that's your job. And the first thing that you need to sell, if this is a tech company, you need a technical co-founder, is to find and sell that person. The way that I did it, like we were lucky how quickly it all came together. But what I do recommend to people is, be in that startup community, talk to lots of entrepreneurs, try and bring value to other people. Like a lot of technical people are having challenges of like, how do I raise money? How do I do things that, that you can potentially be helpful with? And then see how those relationships develop. And the best, the very best co-founders, I think, are people who are out of a failed startup. They are co-founders of another failed startup that have been burned but want to do it again. And that was... Uh, you know, Tom and Rob's, I wouldn't say their startup was failed, but it was probably failing, but it was perfect. They'd been hammering at it for well over a year. They knew how hard it was, but they were still hungry to do it. 
like what better start what founder could you look for and that's what i've sort of in retrospect i'm like okay where when i advise people i say go to these events make sure you connect with founders see how you can give value and be helpful and then just sort of network from there and that that i think is the best way to connect with yeah i think the the biggest mistake that business founders make is they assume that if they find a talented engineer they'll just tell them to build something and then everything will work yeah. and obviously it's not like that yeah as it's hard to to find a talented uh, engineer but it's also hard to do sales yeah and i love that you said you have to sell them on your concept as well i mean when you're recruiting a team you're mm -hmm. also doing sales yeah but then yeah. very very quickly you have to show value like you said and i remember when sergey and i were working on our I think it was second failed startup. Mm -hmm. uh, we were 23 years old and we actually recruited this MIT engineer on the team, but we didn't know what we were doing. And we did get some mm -hmm. users and, and the like, but we couldn't raise money. And uh, very quickly, we didn't prove our value to him. Right. Yeah. And he left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In a matter yeah. of months. Yeah. And so we didn't make that mistake the yeah. next time around. And the next co founder, technical co founder we recruited, uh, we worked with for years mm -hmm. and developed real yeah. relationship because we were creating value as well. Yeah. But when they started working on HubDub, what was the indicator for you that this is going to have a higher likelihood of succeeding or working than the product that they were working on? Well, we had some early success, but it was more success theater, right? So we launched a, an event called Demo, which I don't think is around anymore. It was, this is about 11 years ago. And we got great press because this is a media product. This is a news product. The thing that journalists love writing about more than even than Trump is writing about themselves. Like they love writing about themselves in their industry. And this was a media product. So they wrote a lot about it. We got users. It was for an event? Demo was an event. And so we launched and we had all these prediction markets. This is 2008. So it's the 2008 election. So there's a lot of markets around who was, who was going to win which states. So there's a lot of buzz around it. And so we showed traction. Now, the challenge was after the initial press hype, we showed a lot of like negative traction. So, you know, users falling off. And so we had to then work out what is our second win? How do we grow sustainably? But we know we did get we did get a really good bump at launch, a really good launch. And we got, you know, long term sticky users. And so how long did you build for before you launched? And what is it that you built initially? Oh, we built uh, we started in November. We launched in January. So it was about three months. We needed that kind of okay, we need to get this out quickly. And we were pretty ruthless in what was in the product. And so you never launched to any group of users until you had that initial product? No. You know, it was funny. Um, so we launched Fangio very differently from HubDub. Um, HubDub was a vision and a belief that this was going to be amazing. And so we never really did any user testing. Um, we did maybe a bit of beta testing, see if it worked. But we never really tested the hypothesis that anybody wanted it. And we learned that for Fangio, but no, we didn't do testing. And so who did you think your users were going to be for this prediction? I guess it was a news prediction? It was, yeah, we thought it was like news consumers. But, you know, they get another classic one. And we thought everyone, everyone's interested in the news. Like this is a really big market. People who follow the news will be interested in this product. Mm -hmm. And so how did you, how many users did you get initially after that three month period? Oh, I think I remember in the summer of 2018, um, oh, sorry, 2018, uh, 2008, it being a really big event that we got 10,000 registered users. So we got that after maybe about six months. I remember we had a party and we were waiting for it to clock up to 10,000. And we we're like, you know, we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting as we slowly ticked up. And these are like free registered users. Um, and this is through the press that you guys do? Yeah, just through PR. Like we, and any kind of guerrilla marketing we could do and any kind of stunts and things we could come up with in order to, uh, to drive growth. Because it was a free product, we couldn't spend any money to acquire users. We had to just come up with ways that we drive growth. And what was one way that worked really well? Um, so in PR did work well for us. People loved writing about it. Um, like so you the, just reached out to journalists? We would reach out to journalists or we would create PR worthy things that they would like to write about. Some of the news aggregators like Dig and Reddit were really good to us. 2008 election was really favorable to us. And then in time, SEO worked for us as well. Because if you type into Google, who's going to win the 2008 election, then we started to rank for that question because we had a page that exactly asked that question. And so those were all things that, that worked for us. Got it. Okay, very interesting. So um, 
let's then talk about the transition to FanDuel because yeah. I know that you used some of this early traction and mm-hmm. press hype to raise a little bit of money. I think you raised about a million dollars right. uh, from investors. And then it started to become clear that the product wasn't working and you weren't seeing the growth that you wanted to see. And so you did decide at a certain point to then consider completely different products. So Mm -hmm. can you talk us through that thought process? Because I think it's very difficult for a lot of founders who have a strong belief in their Mm -hmm. vision and their product to cut the cord and say, you know what? We got to try something yeah. new. Yeah. What was that inflection point for yeah. you? What was your framework for making that difficult yeah. decision? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's funny. A lot of people obviously call this like a pivot. And I always think a pivot, having gone through a number of pivots, like real company defining pivots, I always think the word's wrong because a pivot suggests something that's kind of elegant and kind of graceful. A pivot is ugly and messy and painful. Um, it's really hard. Nothing's working. No one agrees on what we should do and you really and you have very little data and you're having to kind of okay we thought that was going to work it isn't working and we're going to have to like come up with something new but we don't have any data to prove that either how do we do that um and it's only in retrospect you look at it as pivotal it's quite elegant you wear that you woke up one morning and said let's go do this and we did this it doesn't look anything like that it's it's ugly and painful and and slow so what happened with uh, hubdub to fangio we were out pitching for our seed. Um, I think we called it our Series A, but it was about a million dollars. The day we pitched in September was the day Lehman Brothers went bust. So like basically it was like a financial crisis. We did finally manage to close that round on Christmas Eve of 2008. So, you know, that was a very turbulent period, very concerning that we're never going to get the money in. I remember at that point, I sort of decided, okay, I have to go and buy some Christmas presents. And that was um, like a seven month period between the Lehman Brothers Oh, no, three, right. three months. It oh, was September months, okay. to December. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. It, was, it wasn't so bad, but it was very nervy. And throughout that entire 2008, I was out selling HubDub, believed in it. They were going to grow. This is going to be our future. And I remember when I came in on 1st or 2nd of January of 2009, I sat down, I looked at our numbers, and it just dawned on me that this isn't working. Like, we're not growing that fast. We don't really have a path to revenue advertising was our numbers were never going to be great enough that advertising was going to make an interesting business and i just remember being really kind of stumped and like oh shit (laughs) like i've just made a commitment we've just raised a million dollars and we're gonna have two years of hell this is just not working and i think for the first month there's kind of like a little bit of denial a little bit of we can make it better But I think pretty quickly we were like, we're on the wrong path. We need to do something different. That's it for part one of our interview with Nigel Eccles. In next week's episodes, we're going to hear about how he grew Fandle into the massive company that it became and why he decided to start from zero again 10 years later, now in a completely different industry which is podcasting, building communities, which is a problem that he's really passionate about solving. Hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next week.